from KPFK Pacifica Radio. This is Rising Up with Sonali and I'm your host, Sonali Kolhatkar. You can watch this program on Free Speech TV and listen to it on Pacifica radio stations and affiliates nationwide. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson took his very first tour of Africa. Visiting six different nations over several days, he cut short his trip by half a day, however, amid conflicting reports about his ill health and pressing matters in Washington. Tillerson, the former ExxonMobil CEO with zero political experience, had to conduct his African tour soon after President Donald Trump is reported to have made disparaging and racist remarks against African nations. More than a year into the Trump administration, there is still no clear approach to U.S. policy in Africa, and many are concerned about China's reach into the resource-rich continent. Now, a new book explores the history of Africa's development, analyzing Western imperialism and economic pillaging, which continues through today. Lee Wengraf is a writer and activist in New York City. Her articles have appeared in International Socialist Review, Socialist Worker, Review of the African Political Economy, and more. She now joins me to discuss her book, Extracting Profit, Imperialism, Neoliberalism, and the New Scramble for Africa. Welcome to the program. Hi, Sonali. Thanks so much for having me. So when we say the new scramble for Africa, of course, we're referring to a a new era that is reminiscent of older eras where Africa's resources and the people seen as resources were uh, pillaged by outside countries. Let's start with history. Um, I think very few people um, know about how the borders of African nations were carved up by the West. Going even before that is, of course, the slave trade, where 12 million uh, people from the continent were um, uh, essentially kidnapped. So how do you view that history as part of the arc of what we see today? I think that's a great question. And one of the things that I really um, had as a priority in writing this book was to show that the two hit that the history is far from being disconnected from the current state of exploitation and inequality that we're seeing on the continent. That a lot of the uh, kind of parameters and the legacy of um, economic exploitation in the colonial era. Um, both through uh, corporate plunder, but also through state intervention, laid down policies and structures that continue to reverberate today. And whether that's through uh, the overhang of old colonial relationships that still shape contracts that were signed right on as uh, these new states came into being, or whether it has to do with the uh, weakness of particular uh, institutions, educational levels, and so on, that really that, that colonial past shapes and very much informs the poverty and inequality that we see today. Of course, there's been several chapters in between these two eras, um, which I can certainly speak a lot about, such as the uh, period of structural adjustment when Africa was really saddled with uh, large amounts of just uh, crippling loans because of a, a global economic crisis that hit Africa very hard. And I think now we're sort of emerging from that. There's a sort of narrative of Africa rising, but still that um, the inequality and exploitation that was shaped a century and a half ago uh, continues to be felt today. One of the things that I tried to do in the book is to uh, reintroduce uh, this classic book by Walter Rodney called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, uh, reintroduce him to a new generation of readers. He is a a Guyanese revolutionary who wrote um, really an opus on uh, this 500 year old history from the pre-slavery period up through uh, the modern day. And I really recommend that. And my intent was to kind of take the end of his book, which is around the uh, the late 60s, as a jumping off point to kind of extend those threads and understand uh, relationships and inequality on the continent today. Mm -hmm. 
So the Walter Rodney's uh, analysis is uh, is so interesting. I'd never honestly never heard of his work, but the history that he writes about is very much, as you were saying, a part of the story today. Tell us a little bit about that history, the Berlin Conference of 1885 and their partitioning of Africa is uh, is a critical part of Africa's history, right? Yes, absolutely. And um, really what emerged there and that the, the Conference of Berlin was where the major powers, the major European powers of the time, uh, really, really quite literally sat around a conference table and um, sort of made, uh, divided up uh, an imperial conquest of the continent and carving out um, uh, essentially areas of interest uh, between the French, the British, uh, the Portuguese, the German empires. Essentially their and colonies, right? Exactly, exactly. And so in a very, in an extremely short period of time, Africa went from a, a nation, uh, I mean, a continent with uh, nations that were had essentially were in the process of state formation and so on to uh, the vast majority of it, 90% of the continent uh, emerging as, as colonized. And so that's really when people refer to the original scramble for Africa. Um, that's really kind of the, the political act that set in motion um, that in which there was a, a plunder for uh, particular raw materials that were highly valued at that time, such as uh, uh, rubber and so on. And now, of course, the, the, the particular materials in question are quite different, but I would argue that there is a similarity today and not just in terms of Western imperialism and uh, designs on, on African resources, but really uh, an imperial uh, competitive battle between the other great powers, namely China today, uh, and also Russia. Right. So staying on that history for a bit, um, the how did Western powers use the classic divide and conquer aspect of ruling a colony to uh, foment, you know, internecine warfare? And how do we see echoes of that today, even involving corporations and governments? Well, I think, uh, I mean, part of, there's a couple of things. I mean, part of what the colonial powers did was to um, look at uh, the, content, the continent's resources, both in terms of human and material resources, as, uh, as raw materials, as, as you said this at the beginning. And so imposing upon that uh, infrastructure and, um, and, and state, local institutions and so on, that really um, best served that interest. So, for example, um, cultivating local client, uh, tribal, so-called tribal leaders that were not necessarily reflective of uh, the democratic aspirations of the colonized people, um, creating uh, institutions such as schools and training that really um, were in the service of creating an, an African workforce to, that was fit to uh, work in the mines, work in the rubber plantations, and so on. So it was a process process both of carving out um, new national borders, new ethnic enclaves and so on, but also um, creating a workforce um, that was um, essentially a pliant workforce and aimed solely at extraction. So you had, for example, over the course of the colonial era, um, where there um, uh, African education actually uh, reversed itself, and um, you know uh, Africans were uh, only educated to the extent to which they could do the jobs that uh, the European colonialists needed them to do. And so, in the mit in the process by which these were um, these borders were sort of artificially imposed, um, there was a divide and, and rule dynamic in which um, there was, uh, you know, a conflict and clash over resources and in which um, these, you know, different ethnic groups were pitted against each other. Um, and I think the Democratic Republic of Congo is probably an area that many listeners have heard some about. Um, this is actually, there's uh, renewed conflicts there, very 
intensely resource rich area, but um, in the Congo, also Rwanda, battles between groups such as the Hutus and the Tutsis, which um, emerged, reemerged in the 1990s, have their roots, for example, in old colonial uh, divisions over mm. ethnicity, language, and so on. And um, then you had the anti colonial struggles and this generation of inspiring pan Africanist anti colonial leaders um, that, uh, that helped, you know, essentially drove out. Uh, the colonizers, and that, of course, marked a really important turning point in Africa's history. And it wasn't a single turning point, it was a series of, of turning points. However, uh, one of the myths that you, that you take on in your book, you identify several myths, is that uh, today Africans are passive victims of authoritarian African rulers. Um, and and this, uh, there is this idea that that uh, African leaders kicked out the West uh, only to reproduce those authoritarian structures here at home. And uh, meanwhile, ordinary Africans remain um, at the whim of these, of, these, um, of these rulers. How do you take on that very reductive view of what's uh, happened in Africa today after the post-colonial struggle? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great question, and there's a, a couple of different elements to that. I mean, first of all, as you say, that uh, Africa has a tremendous history in terms of anti-colonial struggles that um, it, that were actually uh, the the birth of the trade union movement in Africa, the student movement, peasant movements, and so on. Those movements um, certainly did not uh, go away with uh, the dawn of independent nations. I think that there was um, there was a generation of African state leaders in the 60s and 70s, in particular, people like Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, Julius Nyerere in Tanzania, and so on, who represented, um, in particular, the kind of left aspirations of uh, national liberation who came to power uh, on a program of um, uh, national development, uh, state socialism, and um, so-called in some cases, and there's a kind of generation of African socialists. These were not the only um, rulers, uh, or kind of, uh, I think there is um, there's essentially different political wings and so on. There were African rulers that, after independence, hewed a little bit more closely to the former colonial powers. But I think that important piece of this of of, of the the puzzle here is that, with particularly with the crash, as I mentioned before, of world economic prices, uh, commodity prices in uh, the early 70s, uh, African nations that were very young and fairly weak institutionally. Um, economically were really um, thrown back on their heels and compelled to turn to the West for loans. And I think there began, began again um, a certain uh, kind of... Through, through the um, IMF and the World Bank? The, the loans through, through the IMF and the World yes. Bank? Yeah. Yes, exactly. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, uh, which essentially went to these African nations with um, uh, kind of... Uh, with, with hand outstretched, but really with um, very odious terms in which African nations were forced to cut social programs and um, the kind of um, economic policies that would have enabled them to develop diverse economies and really um, develop a more economic independence. And so I think that in that context, you see the emergence in some cases of um, a more um, uh, this phenomenon of state capture of autocracy, meaning that there has been um, a, tr a tendency in some African nations towards a shrinking of democracy, a shrinking of democratic space. But I think it's important to note, as you said, this is sort of a myth I try to confront in my book, that uh, the idea that, that somehow that there is a, a lack of democratic movement or aspiration on the part of ordinary African people is very important to note. And up till the present day, there is a struggle and mass movements for mass-based democracy um, that you can, we can see that right now in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's a clamoring for Joseph Kabila to step down and so on. So I think that there's a very, as you say, reductionistic, very narrowing type of framework that corruption is only somehow the province of African rulers. It's worth also saying that the West 
is certainly chock full of uh, corrupt companies and all sorts of corporate machinations, which I can um, has been seen on the African continent as well. I can certainly. I don't want to go too far off topic, but the the Panama Papers and um, and all of that Paradise Papers have revealed that corruption is by far not the province of African nations alone. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that point. Um, so uh, the uh, the the title of your book is Extracting Profit, and of course, uh, I think that there's a, a clear double meaning there uh, because uh, African countries have been very much um, subject to uh, the uh, the um, kind of predatory practices of extractive industries, particularly uh, oil. And there's this very, very sordid history of uh, oil companies in various African countries like Nigeria, which you discuss in your book as well. How important is, uh, and when we, what sort of era of the scramble for Africa does that represent and does that industry still remain strong in Africa now that it's kind of become this haven for mineral extraction? Um, so you mean oil in particular? Oil in particular. Oil. Is, oil, is oil still yeah. as uh, active? Are oil companies still as active in Africa as they were? Well, th something very interesting uh, started to develop towards the um, towards the end of my writing the book, which is that the U.S. essentially um, underwent something, you know, the shale revolution, which people are uh, familiar with. Up until around 2010, the U.S. surpassed uh, Africa surpassed the Middle East as a source of oil for Africa. But over the course of the Obama administration, there was a strategic turn towards towards developing domestic oil sources um, in the United States. And the U.S. has now uh, just recently surpassed Saudi Arabia as uh, the sec world's second largest oil producer, just following Russia. This is, so, this is the fracking boom that you're talking about, yeah. That's, that's right, exactly. And um, oil prices had uh, dropped down about two, three years ago, had fallen by about 75% from the height, um, and now they've rebounded a bit, and really the African uh, fracking industry is, is booming right now. So what that has actually been tough for um, African oil producing nations, particularly in uh, around 2016, 2017, GDPs in nations like Nigeria and Angola fell uh, quite dramatically, and uh, GDP as a percentage of uh, per capita um, even more so went into the negative numbers. Uh, according to the IMF and the World Bank, those numbers are starting to rebound into the growth, the growth rate territory of 2-3%. Um, at the height of the, the boom of the new scramble for Africa around 2009-2010, uh, many African nations were seeing growth rates of 6-7-8%. Um, so, you know, that's that's uh, that's a dramatic shift. Now, that's the picture of U.S. relations. Now, um, in terms of China uh, and Russia and so on, but particularly China, uh, oil still remains important. Oil still remains important to the U.S., but again, you know, bearing in mind uh, the, the situation I just outlined, but China is... Um, is really, in some ways, the dominant player. Right. On, and on, how has on China Africa. done that? Because the West is very worried about that. And, you know, the, the, ne the neoliberals in government and, uh, and around government are scared about the fact that the Trump administration doesn't seem to have a clear-cut policy because they're worried about China having really spent many years now extending loans to African nations and having corporate... Um, projects in industry in African nations, particularly around mineral extraction. That's right. And this has actually been a process. That this is one of the dynamics that I uh, first, that first drew my attention to this topic over 10 years ago was that it was becoming clear that China was, uh, China's involvement in, in African uh, nation building projects and um, uh, in African economic development was really heightening. And part of that was the sort of um, the desirability of relations with China when compared to the overhang of structural adjustments. So you had the World Bank and the IMF, which had imposed extremely onerous terms on loans um, and really an encroaching 
in many ways that I would call um, in, 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 in imperial terms and, and everything from um, state policy, economic policy, trade agreements to requirements for good governance and so on. China really um, was uh, sought political relations with none of that baggage, it appeared. Now, yeah. I think that a decade or so later, and, and, and what that looked like concretely is um, a large wave of infrastructure building um, where you have, um, for example, the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia was built by the Chinese. Um, there's highways, uh, pipelines, all sorts of um, bridges, hospitals, and so on uh, that have been built by the Chinese. And I think that that's one of the, the a question I think that's important for the left to uh, to understand and for progressives to understand is that China, in my view, is an imperial country that is uh, that is undergoing these projects for their own particular political and economic interests. That these are not humanitarian projects. And what I think is um, kind of unfolding now in more recent years is that in fact the Chinese do have terms of their own. They um, they require, they, they've been calling in loans, um, they have um, uh, actually so, required- So the loans kind of set up the leverage that they're now using. Yes, that's right. I hmm. think, I mean, I think that there's been a different political dynamic. China also historically has had um, you know, as a non-colonial power uh, in terms of the prior colonial era, was able during the Cold War and afterwards to enter into African relations with sort of almost a clean slate right. um, and play a particular role, as did the Soviet Union and Cuba to some, you know, to some extent in, in that period. But I think, again, there's been some areas that have been problematic um, I think now that African states are starting to confront, for example, uh, labor violations at Afri at various African work sites, mines. They have sidestepped and ignored particular local content requirements, which means that uh, Chinese companies are sort of flouting any agreement to use local labor and importing Chinese labor. That um, So what that means is that it reproduces those same relations of exploitation that we saw uh, right. a century ago. Lee, I wanted to step back, though. We skipped over one important part of the story when, uh, especially uh, you and I are speaking here in the United States. Um, the United States has used military force in Africa as a way to kind of bolster its interests. And under George W. Bush, there was a whole infrastructure set up under uh, the U.S. African Command, U AFRICOM for short, and um, and and it's interesting to see, of course, that uh, those that there was some very strategic decisions made there. I'm not sure how uh, President Obama uh, uh, wielded that military power, and and what Donald Trump is now thinking in terms of the U.S. military presence there. So, if you can discuss uh, Africom as it relates to this idea of how the West has extracted profit from Africa. Yeah, this is a very, I'm glad you brought that up. It's it's an extremely significant development. Uh, so George Bush launched AFRICOM in 2007. And it's interesting as a side note that no African nation was willing uh, at that time or since then to host AFRICOM on its soil. It's actually headquartered in Stuttgart, Germany. But in any case, um, there was a, in the sort of post 9-11 era and the beginnings of, um, of uh, Islamic uh, terrorism, so to speak, in the, on the African soil, and generally a, a, coupled with the drive and the, com uh, the competitive drive for resources, that the US administration began to look more strategically at relying on its military force, which is you know, really the, the kind of feather in the cap of the US um, arsenal, to mix metaphors, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there is um, a major uh, military base was set up in the small island nation of Djibouti, uh, Camp Lemonnier. And, uh, and what and what's happened since then, and in fact, a lot of um, expansion happened in a very interesting and um, I think actually quite frightening way under Obama, which is that the military footprint of uh, of the U.S. Uh, of the U.S. military spread 
quite um, comprehensively across the continent. And what Obama did was he set up uh, a large range of sort of more um, uh, kind of hidden or uh, small scale forward operating bases, drone um, drone landing bases and training operations. So there was a veneer of uh, kind of partnership, cooperation on the part of the military under Obama, but really it was quite insidious because what it meant was that there was uh, the Afri African finger, I mean, American military fingerprints on African uh, defense forces. So um, training, um, all this kind of thing, and really using this as a tool to shore up support for allies. So for example, Uganda um, has been a recipient of, of uh, a large, a fair number of, fair amount of military aid, but there's sections such as the, the Sahel region, which is sort of a band that stretches across Africa, which has been sort of seen as a key uh, of the sort of northern section just below the Sahara, has been seen as kind of a key counterterror region. And um, it's uh, where the U.S. has been strategically focused uh, in terms of um, some of the fighting in Mali uh, and now in Niger and so on. So. Um, this is something that I think is being played out in a very dangerous way. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the show that Rex Tillerson is uh, currently on the continent, and I think he is leaving uh, Tuesday the 13th. Um, so he, he's spent a whole week there, which is quite interesting, and I think um, is, is essentially promising an increased military presence. Somalia is a very important area where the U.S. military has been there as long as it has been in Afghanistan. Uh, China, on the other hand, has been steadily increasing its military presence there as well. Um, about a year and a half ago, opened up a mil military base just footsteps away from the U.S.'s headquarters on the, or the U.S.'s main base at Camp Lamornier. Um, there's other major powers that have military operations there. It's right on the near the Suez Canal, so incredibly strategically important, uh, just footsteps away from the Middle East. So. I think in a fairly dangerous way, you're seeing, um, you know, unfolding imperial tensions that are spilling over from economic ones into military ones. I'm not, I'm not necessarily suggesting there's going to be a full-fledged war on the continent of Africa between China and the U.S., but there are military skirmishes that are currently that are an outgrowth of some of these tensions. Mm -hmm. I want to end, uh, Lee, with a discussion of how, as someone who has studied this issue deeply, how you think things could have progressed or could proceed from now on in a way that doesn't leave um, Africa in shambles, that doesn't see uh, rising inequality and continued poverty. One of the myths that you say uh, is there in, our, in your book, people think of Africa as being cursed by natural resources. And that's unfortunately, even on the left, a lot of people have um, had that approach or that lens through which to view Africa, the curse of the natural resources, this continent rich in natural resources uh, has you know, become pillaged and become the target for pillaging because of the natural resources. Um, why is that a myth? It is, it is a myth because I think the resource curse has been a little bit of a sort of easy way to um, sidestep the West and imperial responsibility for the exploitation of resources and to paper over the fact that the extraction that's taking place in the continent has actually set development for ordinary Africans backwards. And so this is a resource curse that is not born of African kleptocracy or corruption or something that is somehow innate that uh, Africans can never um, fight for and aspire and, uh, and create democratically driven societies in which they make decisions about their own resources. In my book, I tried to show some examples of grassroots struggles in places like Nigeria and South Africa where these questions, um, whether it's in uh, the, the workers, in mining workers union, for example, or communities in the Niger Delta, uh, 
where activists and so on have uh, organized together and, and said these are our national re our, our natural resources, meaning um, they should be owned and the decisions made by all of us so that we can make fair decisions about uh, the quality of the air, the conditions we work under, and, um, and an end to the sort of inequality. There's a lot of political cha changes that are really very interesting right now, the changing, um, the uh, rise to power, the taking of power of, uh, of Ramaphosa in South Africa, I think is going to pose some challenges and interesting questions for the left there. And one of the most active forces on the left is the uh, is uh, the National uh, Union of Mines of South Africa, NAMSA, that have often raised questions about the nationalization of resources. You know, we'll, we'll see. I, I also want to just say very um, quickly, too, that um, one of the things that Tillerson, and this is separate from the resource question, but I think important for those of us on the left in the U.S. to understand, is that the U.S. has been, as they've been funneling more money into defense, there has been a flood of both investments that are driving the theft of land and resources, and though, and we some of that is our um, retirement of funds, for example, if you're a New York State worker, but also I think um, that, and, and social programs. Programs. Uh, just two days ago, Tillerson in Kenya announced he was going to cut money, um, large uh, amounts of funds, from programs uh, to treat people with AIDS. And this is devastating. And I think if ordinary people here in this country knew about that, I think there's a sense of solidarity and a sense of outrage that could drive some of that change that you um, right. alluded to. Well, I want to thank you so much, Lee, for joining us today. And good luck with your book. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Lee Wengraf is a writer and activist based in New York City. Her articles have appeared in the International Socialist Review, Socialist Worker, Review of African Political Economy, and other publications. We've been discussing her newest book, Extracting Profit, Imperialism, Neoliberalism, and the New Scramble for Africa. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. We're online at risingupwithsonali.com, where you can sign up for our daily newsletter. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, and Vimeo.